All right, so uh, these talks were phenomenal, and these people are obviously a lot intellectually smarter than I am. Probably that's why they got to where they were faster than I did. But uh, it's like when I applied for medical school, I was interviewing at UCIS, which is the Uniformed Services of uh, uh, Health Sciences. It's like the military medical school, and I was sitting amongst people like this, and I, I was like running the gourmet seafood room in Harris Casino, and I was sitting next to people like this, and we went down the row, like you guys are sitting, who are you? And there are people like from West Point, and I drove a nuclear sub, and I did glutamate research, and I went to law school, and, and it got to me, and I thought, should I just lie? And, and <laughs> In public, or am I really going to say that I run the Gourmet Seafood Room at Harris Casino? Nonetheless, I did, and I, I'm, uh, I ended up in the same kind of place. So, well, br well a lot of my talk is going to be similar to theirs, and, and I know the lights are low, and it's late, and if you're not off, I, won't, I will not take offense to it. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, how I decided to get into neuroradiology, what a career in neuroradiology is like, what I personally do, a little bit about academic settings, and how did the NIH play a role in all of this. So a lot of you guys, at least when I was talking to you over the lunch, when Lance asked you, a lot of you were from high school and college, and your road probably looks like this. High school, bachelor's, MCAT. Maybe you'll go to medical school, maybe you won't. You know, this is just a medical school path. Residency, and then you finally become a doctor, or a lawyer, or a famous glutamate researcher, or insert your title there. My road looks something like this. And uh, there's probably some going up the hill for me. Or, or something like this, where I, I was in high school, I went to Dorchester High in Boston, which is the exact other end of the red line from Harvard. Harvard's on one end, Ashmont is on the other. And I live two blocks up the road from Ashmont. I worked at Hobart when I was about 12 years old. You could get paid under the table. You probably can't even do that anymore. But you could get like 40 bucks a day to go wash dishes at some, you know, godforsaken kitchen somewhere. Uh, but I learned a lot there. There was no internet, there's no food channel, there's no other way to learn things other than the people you knew. And uh, someone taught me cold food, uh, how to prepare food, someone taught me how to prepare hot food, I worked a line, I worked every station of the line, and it was very similar to some aspects of residency in that it's a brigade system and there are people higher than you that, at least when I went through medical training, you really didn't talk back to. Uh, I became an assistant chef while I was still in high school. So I would go from high school to the kitchen and help run a kitchen, then became a head chef. At the same time, my parents wanted me to go to college, which I was opposed to, because I had kind of worked my way out the back of the house. I was making pretty good money from someone from Dorchester. And uh, unfortunately, my brother went to college the year before me, so I was kind of stuck. Uh, so I went to Johnson Wales University, which has anybody ever even heard of that? Exactly. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's exactly what happened on my interview, which is probably good or bad. Essentially, I got a degree in food service management, right? Nobody is here in the food service management degree track, right? No hands would go up. Uh, nobody cares about menu design or cost of a restaurant. But I worked, at, I, worked I ran the kitchen in the Omni Biltmore. I, I uh, ran a restaurant cafe in the barn until the owner sniffed enough cocaine to have to burn it down to pay for his coke habit. I did catering at Garden and Merchant. I got a bachelor in food service management. I got recruited to the Sands, Harris, did post back, took the MCATs, <laughs> went to med school, right? It just fits right in there. Uh, and did residency and went to NIH. So I trained a lot. When I was 15 and a half, I got a degree. I got a, you know, you can't even work at knives at 15 and a half now. Let's just be honest, right? You couldn't get a job with a slicer. Uh, but I was taken to this little red building overlooks the costume. That anchors Newbury Street in Boston Garden. And the Ritz-Carlton is there. The other thing I learned when I went back and looked at what I did in life, none of these places even exist anymore. Uh, it's now the Taj. It's not even the Ritz-Carlton anymore. Still nice, though. I went to Johnson Wales University, which is where you go if you want. At the time, it was a college. And you went there for food service management, hospitality management, a stenographer, which is those people in court that have the funny little typewriters. I don't even know if they, well, I know they exist because I had a deposition the other day, and one of them was there. Not for me, I was just, uh, and, and, and they had equine studies, right? So there are people studying horses, someone studying equine, and someone studying food service management. Luckily, it's not rigorous. Uh, you didn't need the SATs to get in. And, and it was right near my, my, you know, my town, this was in Providence. And this is the 18th floor of the Biltmore, where we did a lot of parties, functions, and I ran the restaurant downstairs, but I would help out up there. 
Uh, I did off-premise catering in 92. We did things like tributes for John Williams. We did up to like 2,000, 3,000 people, high-end events. We did the backyard of the Breakers, the Newport Mansions. It was high-end. Then we, we catered, we filled the aquarium, the science museum. And it's, it's, it's ironic when you're like sauteing animals and stuff right in front of animals. <laughs> so we would like throw food into the penguin thing, even though we weren't supposed to. But you know, we were in the kitchen. We were like pirates, and rogues, and drug addicts back there. I mean. We were not you guys. We did big, big things at Plymouth Plantation. I was at a function. I met the vice president of Sands Casino. And they said, who's running this affair? And I said, well, I am. I was running around walkie-talkies. And we had Mack trucks full of food and 1,000 people to feed. And they said, you ever think of working in the casino? And I said, uh, no. I'm, and I'm working right now. Like, we're really busy. I don't have time to talk to you. But she gave me her card. And uh, she recruited me down to the Sands Casino in Atlantic City to run the Gourmet Steakhouse. And the reason I went was, one, they were going to put me up in the Sands for free. And I thought, that's sweet. Uh, I said, can I bring my, can I bring my girlfriend? It's not my wife. They said, sure. So they put us up in this suite, and we stayed on there for a couple of days for free. And I thought, this is the place I want to work, right? They, they've got some cash. They could pay me a good deal of money. Uh, this doesn't exist anymore either. It's the first casino imploded in Atlantic City. I had no idea. I looked it up on the web. It was like exploding. And I thought, oh, I used to work there. Uh, there was almost a strike when I was there. I'm going to get off topic, so we're not going to get through this whole talk. There was a strike there when I was there. But you know you're falling asleep. It's the afternoon, so we should just talk. Uh, there was a strike there, and the head of the meatpacking strike came up to do strike negotiation. In my kitchen, I had a pretty loyal following in my kitchen because I ran a tight ship. And they said, Chef Jay, we like you a lot, but come 12 p.m., you better leave this place and not come back in here because we will not hesitate to turn your car over and let people get at you. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what the hell is wrong with me? How did I get into this? I should have stayed in Boston. Uh, luckily, they boarded the whole casino up up to the 12th floor. I mean, they were ready for war. It was crazy. There was a strike in Atlantic City in the 60s and it did not, or 70s. It did not go over well. This is the steakhouse, which we were voted best in Atlantic City for the internet, for Yelp, for Tinder or Twitter. You can put a picture of my steak on the internet. Uh, we had a 42 ounce T-bone, it was really good. I got recruited to Harrah's, but at the same time, I was working out. So I went from doing off-premise catering, six, seven days a week, six, seven a.m. till midnight, one a.m. every day, multiple parties to be done, to working at the casinos, which essentially I had union personnel and I was just coming in at three because the gourmet rooms were open and I thought it wasn't even like work. So I had a lot of time to work out on my hands. And I was working out. None of these people are the people who I worked out with. Uh, I was a state cop. There was this doctor, Dr. Bob. That's not him. Uh, there was a physical therapist. And then there was me. And we were this hodgepodge. I had a goatee and slick back hair. That, that's not me either. But we would work out at 5.30 AM. And we'd have like life conversations in the morning while we're benching and running and things. And, and I had kids. And Bob said, well, what are you going to do with your life when these kids get older? You know, they were a little older than me. And I thought, I don't know. I'm going to work till 1 in the morning. And, you know, Frank Sinatra comes in, we're going to feed him. And I'm, I don't know, what do you mean, what am I going to do? This is the only thing I've ever done. I'm going to become assistant sous chef of the casino, then, then executive chef of the casino, then vice president of food operations. That was my goal. And he said, uh, you know, maybe you should think about what else you could do. And I, I didn't have, no one in my family had gone into medicine. Nobody had ever had science. I went to a public high school in the city. Uh, so I said, well, let me see what you do. So I went and followed him around. And it turns out, he did stuff that I thought was pretty interesting, and I had never heard of any of it. And I took a class in anatomy in the morning because I really had a lot of time on my hands, like I said. And I loved it. I fell in love with anatomy. I just really loved it. I don't know why. Just like some of the other speakers said, something does it for you, and I really loved it. So I, I had a job offer to take over the gourmet seafood room at Harris, which was called William Fisk at the time. Now it's called McCormick and Schmitz. Like everything else, it's turned into a chain. Um, and, I, and I went to school in the morning, and I took two and a half years it took, because you can imagine you don't have any chemistry, biology, physics, calculus, none of that stuff is in the food service management program, right? <laughs> There's no organic chemistry one, although there might be now, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and then I went back to school, and I went to Richard Stockton State College. Anybody ever hear of Richard Stockton State College? Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> exactly. So this is, you see it on my transcript, like what Dr. Heiss saw, right? He's probably like... Never heard of it, never heard of it. Oh, you can cook. That, that would probably might be interesting. <laughs> this place, though, in 1993, there were these kids checking these things in the parking lot with these long sticks. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, the entire campus is geothermal. I said, uh, all right. I have no idea what that is. So they were green way before their time. The entire campus has been geothermal since 93. 
and I took all my post backs there. And the guy who's the head of like going back to medical school said, you should get another degree. We're not going to write you a letter uh, because you don't have a second degree and you're not competitive. And I thought, all right, I'm not getting another degree. I'm going to get my own letters and, you know, I'll show you kind of thing. I didn't say that, but I said, thank you very much. Really nice of you to consider me. Uh, so I, while I was doing this, I took over a kitchen. I was always challenged by stuff. I got bored really quickly. Maybe I had attention deficit disorder like Kevin did, but I got bored really quickly. Once I had a kitchen running fine-tuned, it was successful, I had a positive menu, time to move on. Uh, so I took over this place, Old Waterway Inn, which two executive chefs from casinos owned, and it was historic in that this is Atlantic City in the background. This was our deck. And this used to be how they ran alcohol during Prohibition into the Atlantic City air, uh, area. So this was like where the mob would hang out and there was a brothel on the second floor. And that's essentially what this used to be. Uh, and then it became a restaurant that I, I, I ran. So I applied to 20 to 30 schools thinking that, you know, I might not get into some because I'm from a school that no one's ever heard from. And I have a degree of things that nobody even knows what that is. And I started getting these, uh, you know, I interviewed at about 10 and I got into one, and, and I started getting all these podiatry letters in the mail. You guys probably never got these because you're really smart. But when you're not, and you, get, you, know, you start getting these, I said, how do these podiatry people even know who I am? And I, who wants to work? If you're a podiatrist, I'm sorry, or your dad's a podiatrist, but I did not want to work with feet. That just sounded nasty. So I got into Howard, and my wife was able to transfer her job down here. I was married to kids, and we went to Howard, and this is not my class, but it's a recent class. And it's a real mix of people. Howard's traditionally African-American college, but the medical school is, is pretty diverse. Uh, and there's me with one of my kids. I wasn't the traditional people in that I had kids. I was a little bit older, uh, but there I am. So I applied in this summer. I wanted to do neurosurgery. And the reason I wanted to do neurosurgery was I was working in Harris Casino, and I got a call one night that said, your friend Tori just got stabbed to death. And he was a kid that I grew up with. And he got stabbed about 16 times in downtown Boston, wrong place, wrong time, fight broke out. It's just kind of growing, growing up in the city, that's what happens. And he was brought back to life, but was in a persistent vegetative state. So that was 95, and he's still in a persistent vegetative state right now. But you remember, I'm, I was a chef back then, and I didn't understand any of that. So I went up to see him, and he was in the ICU, and he's dead, but he's alive. And, I didn't understand any of that stuff, uh, but it was emotionally disturbing. And I thought, well, someone's got to understand the brain better than what these people are explaining to us. And I figured when I got to med school and I was already kind of thinking about going back to school, I figured who, I asked someone like, who knows the most about the brain? And someone said, well, a neurosurgeon. It's probably you, but <laughs> you know, someone told me it's the neurosurgeon. Uh, so I said, well, I, I want to do neurosurgery. So I went to the neurosurgeon at Howard. There was one. And he said, well, you should go to the NIH in the summertime. They have a program at the NINDS. And I talked to this neurologist. They said, yeah, you should apply for that. And there was no Google. You couldn't Google, what should I do this summer? Like, uh, neurological, how do I be a neurosurgeon? You know, the internet was just starting. Uh, so you, you had to know people that knew stuff. Uh, so I applied, and I got in, to my surprise. And I worked with Dr. Heiss in the department of neurosurgery, and Ed Oldfield was the chairman at the time. And there was a whole crew of people, Rizard Pluta and Eric and these fellows. And I worked with the fellows. I would come in around with them in the morning time because they saw all kinds of cool stuff. They were the ones that were on call at night. You know, I said, call me if something interesting happens. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. There were Carrie one patients, Von Hippel-Lindau patients, pituitary patients. Uh, and I got to go to the OR. I'd never been in the OR before. You know, I remember the first time they did a craniotomy and they opened the dura and there was the brain and they were mapping it and they were putting these little letters on the, on the brain. And you probably don't remember that I was there, but I was there. And because I was just silent, just stand there and be quiet, right? Uh, just like the kitchen. It's a brigade system. Like that guy's the head and you are the dishwasher. So <laughs> you stay over there. But I remember seeing the brain pulse and the dura off and I'm thinking, there it is. You know, that thing holds a secret to why my buddy is alive but dead. And I, and I thought, that's what I want to work in. I want to work in there. And, and it, it was just fascinating to me. And, and this place opened that possibility up. We went to lab meetings, and uh, there was a kid. We talked about this a little quickly. I want to elaborate, but I learned pretty quick, don't be a know-it-all, because there's probably people in this program, or there's people in medical school, there's people everywhere. That's, there's always somebody who knows everything. Uh, he cut rat brains all summer, I think, and he was, like, isolated. Uh, you shouldn't be a know-it-all. 
this is my program. I saved some stuff from this I found. It was 1998, and you can see what was important to me because it has all the red exclamation points, right? It's payday every Tuesday. Funny enough, I get paid every Tuesday now, so this would have been a good month because that's a triple payday. Uh, and I worked, I worked in neuroradiology, though. Uh, I worked on a project that Dr. Heiss had already been working on and, and, and it's working out the pathophysiology of stringomalia, and I did CINE MRI of patients with Chiari malformations, pre and post decompression. And it was my first exposure to radiologists, first exposure to radiology, first exposure to working with data, right? You don't work in any data when you're figuring out your food cost. There's, you know, I, I never made spreadsheets, any of that. And, uh, here's a spreadsheet from back then. Uh, these are all the different flow measurements of CSF flow, which you heard a lot from uh, Lance about how CSF flows. And I would print them out, and they had this really sweet color printer with some wax on it. And I would bring this, and Dr. Heiss would say, why are you printing this in color? And I'd say, well, I have no access to this stuff where I, where I am, right? You know, I thought it was awesome because this place had access to everything. So uh, I, we made slides. You, you probably don't even know what these are, but they're slides that fit in a little carousel, and you press a little button, it goes and the little carousel rotates, and a light shines through it and puts the picture up there. Uh, it's like ancient to you guys. But I learned how to make slides, learn how to make pictures, learn how to do a presentation, all of that stuff. Remember, I was a blank slate, no knowledge of. Uh, we had zip drives, 100 megabytes, right? <laughs> Probably fit that in like a ring now. I, I, I found this thing in my, in my office. There's no way you'd even read it. I called somebody. I said, do you have a computer you can hook a zip drive up to? And they said, absolutely not. Uh, and then we had these huge, these were gold, you know, two gigabytes in 1998. I mean, that is unbelievable. I don't even know you put this in. Oh, we do have some radiology equipment you can put it in. So what did I learn? I peeked into this world that I never even knew existed, right? Dr. Bob back in the gym never told me about all this. Uh, there were all these brilliant minds, and, and it's helpful to be around other smart people, even if you're not the smartest person there. Like someone told me at Mayo one time I was working on this retired guy who was pretty famous. Uh, in his time, and he said, you know, this is the, the number one place to be a second-rate physician. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I am constantly surrounded by brilliant people, and I would have to be mentally incapable to not be smart, you know, just because I've surrounded with all these really smart people. And, and he was right. I learned that every member of the team had something to add, and I, I work like this to this day. This was the paper, and Dr. Heiss, you can see him there, he put my name on this paper. I was shocked. Uh, although I did work, you know, but I thought, who would put a BS on the paper, right? But there's two of us. So I learned that, you know, if someone does work with you, you owe it to them to, 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 to put them on the paper or, you know, give it back to them. Em embrace your curiosity for that. I learned that people didn't have impossible ideas. We'd go to these lab meetings, people had these ideas, and they would just questions and hypotheses and how are you going to answer that? They weren't, they weren't like, well, that's a dumb idea. Although maybe they said it when the students weren't around, but nobody said it when I was there. I was exposed to all kinds of facets of medicine, the career opportunity, I went to grand rounds, multidisciplinary meetings. Uh, I came back my second summer. I worked at Khalid Bashar, and we tried to figure out physiology of timing using functional MRI. So as a second year medical student, not resident, I was learning about advanced MRE imaging that we weren't doing clinically. And nine years ago at Mayo, we started doing functional MRI on our glioma patients and I work in a big multidisciplinary neuro-oncology group at Mayo. And you know what I thought 16 years ago? Someone said, you know, to keep your eyes open. I think it was you who said it, that, that said things that you learned in the past, whether it be in the kitchen or in biochemistry, it, it may all come to play in the future. You have no idea. So take it all in while you're here. Uh, uh, so here's a lady, 50-year-old female, leiomyosarcoma. That's a bad tumor to have. She had focal radiation. She had a seizure, rapidly lost consciousness. Note to self, if you start smelling metallic tastes or smelling foul odors and there's no foul odor around, it could be a seizure. Uh, and she's got this limbic uh, tumor, which is in a bad location. This is an insular tumor. There's vessels in here. It's hard to get at. It's not a great location or a great tumor to have. It's not enhancing. Turns out if you hold your breath, your CO2 goes up. And when your CO2 goes up, intracranially you vasodilate, which increases oxygen delivery, right? Because you're holding your breath and your brain wants to breathe. So you need some oxygen. When you increase your oxygen delivery, but there's no increase in your brain in oxygen extraction. So it's putting a lot more oxygen up there by vasodilatation. There's no increase in oxygen extraction. So you get more oxygenated blood to your brain. And you can measure that with MRI. So here is a, here is a breath hold image that just shows there's activity in these areas. They're getting blood. So you can ask people questions like, 
Mary wears a blue shirt. Is her shirt blue? And she silently presses a little button. Her answer's in her brain. And you can see, where's her speech? Where does it lateralize to? Is it on her? Is it on the side that's dominant or is it on the side you're about to resect? Um, and her side, you can have, there's three paradigms we do for language. Uh, are the Red Sox champions? I'm from Boston. Are the Yankees not? Uh, is a penguin a truck? <laughs> I make my own functional MRI paradigms. You know? Even for the Somali immigrants, I translate this. Uh, you can do silent word generation, like does neuroradiology rock? Uh, and then you can overlap all these all these paradigms and see where is this lady's speech. Now, it's not 100%. People have bilateral brokers, bilateral Wernickes. You know, that's learning more and more speech as it goes along. But most of her speech is on the left side. There's a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And you can count that there's a good chance you're going to have speech when you wake up, or they're going to do it awake and map out critical speech areas while they, while they resect. I worked here all throughout medical school. I went over the high-performance computing communication uh, I worked with six other medical students, some from overseas, some from Hawaii. I worked with Terry Yu and Dave Chen, and this was kind of the land of bunnies and dragons and the Navy and 3D printing. You probably didn't have this in the Navy. Uh, <laughs> but I put it there because Dave Chen was always working on imaging, and 3D images are made out of uh, small triangles, uh, solid 3D images, and he was always trying to decrease the amount of triangles in a certain uh, 3D image, and they were bunnies and dragons. I said, why are they bunnies? He said, well, that's just the standard model. But every time I went to ask him a question with some bunny or dragon on the screen, I thought, wow, that's, I'll just have to take his word for it and figure he's not some serial killer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I went over to Bethesda Navy. This is pre-9-11, so this campus was open. You could walk over to the Navy, you can walk back. And, and we did a 3D printing project in 2001. So you all probably hear about 3D printing all the time. But I can tell you it's pretty rare to ever hear about 3D printing. But I, I was asking people about projects, things that are around, and I heard about this guy over at... at uh, Bethesda that had a 3D printer. That led to a publication in 2001, the first time I ever left the country to present our data in Nuremberg, Germany. It was the first medical meeting I ever went to, and I fell in love with that environment. So again, there were tons of what I thought were billion people, smart people trying to solve complex problems, all coming together at this uh, computer and surgery meeting in Nuremberg, and I, I just loved it. Uh, that led to a publication as well. We, we built essentially drill guides for pedicle screws. Uh, so I got exposure to advanced technology. We were 3D printing 14 years ago. There was this Internet 2 at the...